welcome. It's very nice to be here and be part of your meeting. So what we're going to talk about uh, now is uh, surgery in osteogenesis and perfecta. And we're going to focus mainly on the main problem areas, which are the long bones. There we go. And I'm going to give you a bit of an update on what's new and what's different and what we're doing to try and make things better for people who do have brittle bones and in particular osteogenesis imperfecta. So just to warn you, if you're a bit squeamish, there are a couple of pictures of surgery here. Um, and basically what I'm going to tell you is some of the controversies, what's new, and also I think one important thing to say is that surgery only forms a part of the management of OI. It's a multidisciplinary problem that needs a multidisciplinary team. And so it's one facet of treatment that hopefully will make things better for people with the condition. So when we talk about long bones, by long bones I mean the tibia, the shin bone, the femur, the thigh bone, and also the funny bone, the humerus. Some people would consider the two bones of the forearms a long bone as well. And if I'm honest with you, the way in which we treat problems in terms of deformity and fractures hasn't really changed that much over the last few decades. What we do know is that surgery is one way that has been proven to reduce fracture rates and fracture, the fracture incidence improve function and help people achieve uh, developmental milestones. And some of the difficulties we have are choosing what types of rod to use. We've got choices between things we call telescopic rods or fixed rods. Also, with regards to the telescopic rods, and by that I mean a rod that's a bit like a, uh, a radio aerial. It's got two parts that grow with the bone in people that still have growth remaining. And we know that kids are more likely to fracture with OI and fracture rates do decrease even without any form of treatment as, as people with OI get older. The other thing that's important that we can address is how we deal with a, a bone that's deformed in terms of the surgical techniques by which we straighten it. So here comes the first surgery picture and apologies to that, I'll hide it for those of you that have seen, but basically that's the way we used to straighten bones uh, in OI. Up to recently, some people still do it. And it's called the Sofield Miller Technique, named after some guys from the US. And we call it the shish kebab technique. So the reason we do this is not because we're obsessed with eating kebabs, although being Greek, I could say that that's an important part of my life. Um, if you imagine you've got a tube that's curved like a C, if you want to straighten that and put a rod down the centre of the bone to keep it straight, you can't divide it in one place. You have to divide it in a number of places to make it straight. And in the past, the way that we used to do this was by exposing the whole of the bone, stripping off the periosteum, which is a thick layer of tissue that goes around these long bones, that gives its, its blood supply and gives most of the potential for healing. So although this made the surgery very straightforward, it did mean that you were damaging the tissue that really you need for the fractures to heal. And that meant that there were rates of delayed healing of the bones and also non-unions. And obviously that can happen with any form of surgery, whether you do it in a specific way or not. Um, and we still sometimes need to do that, particularly where people have had so many fractures that there is no cavity, no canal within the long bone itself. But with other techniques that we're using in other conditions with orthopaedics, we've been able to modify this. So what we do now is we use techniques that minimise the trauma to the bone and the lining of the bone so that you don't damage that periosteum, so you cause as little harm to the bone as possible to give it the best potential to heal. And we can do that through very small incisions in the femur, the thigh bone, in the shin bone, the tibia, because the blood vessels and nerves are very close to the bone, you have to make them ever so slightly bigger to protect the other structures. And the other things that we try to do is make sure the bones are as healthy as possible after surgery. And we all know that if you use your bones, if you walk on them, you move them, your bone density is better than it is if you're off your feet. So someone, let's say, who's, who's um, give you an example, someone who's wheelchair bound for six weeks will lose some of the strength of their bones. So by mobilising and getting things going as soon as possible after surgery, you should therefore make it less likely that there will be problems with the healing and also with the risk of further fractures. But the difficulty here is if you've performed a procedure, what you can't do is compromise the success of the procedure by putting weight through the limb or, or mobilising a limb too early and therefore counteracting the, the reason you did the surgery in the first place. The other thing that you heard earlier this morning is bisphosphonates as well. We're still not quite sure where, how we stop them, when we stop them and when we restart them after surgery. 
or before surgery, there is evidence to suggest that there might be delayed healing, um, and also evidence of the opposite. So at the moment, certainly under my care, patients will stop their bisphosphonates at the time of surgery, for example, with a fracture. And as soon as we look like we're doing well from the healing point of view, we'll restart them. And this technique's not just done here, it's something that's becoming more popular around the world, and we're seeing better outcomes as a result of that. This is the last picture of surgery for those of you who, or you've not had lunch yet, so it shouldn't be too bad. But this is an example of a side view of someone with OI who's um, got a bow in their shin bone, the tibia. And the silver things basically show you how you would approach that to divide the bone, to get it straight and then put a new rod down. And the picture that you can see is looking at the front of the shin bone, and you can see there five small incisions through each one the bone has been divided before the bone has been rodded. So that's what you end up with with a new rod. The picture to the left of your screen is three weeks after surgery and the one to the right is two years. Nice straight bone, the telescopic rod is telescoping, so protecting it with growth. Um, and pretty much, hopefully, by doing this through less invasive techniques, although it's technically more challenging, gives us better outcomes. So we talked about the radio aerial, the telescopic rod, and also fixed rods. So by fixed rod, I just basically mean a rod made of metal that stays the same size. Now these certainly do have a role still to play, particularly in very young children where a telescopic rod won't fit. But we know that telescopic rods, if you compare them to fixed rods, have a reduced rate of reoperation because the, although the bone grows, the rod, if the rod doesn't grow, there's gonna be an area that's not protected and therefore a higher risk of fracture. So those are the, the two choices that we have. Now, those of you with children or who have had rods in the last decade or so, we'll have heard of the fascia duval rods. This is one that's been developed in Canada, in Montreal, and it's the most popular rod, telescopic rod that's used for OI and <coughs> other conditions um, in the world at the moment. And it can be used from 18 months and is just really for the long bones, the femur, the tibia, and the, the funny bone, the humerus. And the advantage of this rod compared to rods that we were previously using in terms of telescopic rods was that you only need to make one incision at the top of the bone to put the rod down. Obviously, if you've got deformities, you will need to divide the bone through other incisions. But technically, it's a lot easier. And the reason this rod has probably become popular is because it's very easy to put in. And the reason you can put it just from one end is because it's got threads at the bottom of the male component, so the rod that fits down and telescopes one cylinder inside the other cylinder, so that one's solid. And you see from the bottom picture, it screws into what we call the epiphysis, where the bone quality is slightly better. It's a bit more like a honeycomb at the end of the bone, anchors it a bit more firmly. So that's the rod that we're all using, but it's not perfect. I mean, no rod is ever going to be perfect because the, the metal will fatigue if you put too much force through it. But this is an example of a patient who's got a fracture in their femur. You can see the picture to the far left. There's also a bend in the bone. So you can see you wouldn't get a, a rod that's straight down that bone. So they've had surgery. They've had an extra division of bone, what we call an osteotomy done. And if you look at the central pictures, you can see the rod that's inside the one that's more of a cylinder sticking up at the top. Now, if you look at the picture to the far right where you've got the orange circles, what you can see is the thin part of the rod is now much longer because this child has grown and the rod has grown with them. But if you look more closely at the top, the bit at the top that anchors into the top of the femur has sunk down a little bit. What that tells you is that the rod is no longer telescoping. And if you look at this next picture, you can see it's sunk down more at the top and also at the bottom. It started to pull out of the bottom of the bone. So this is the problem that we see with the telescopic rods. And as a result, this patient's needed further operation uh, to put a new rod in, which is much bigger. And obviously, a, a rod that's thinner has less ability to resist deformation than one that's thicker. Um, this is a recent paper that's been published in the last few months from the States, where they've looked at particular reasons why rods bend in osteogenesis imperfecta. And there are a number of factors that we still need to look at. But we are becoming more aware of this, particularly with this FD rod. Now, we live in an era where we're meant to practice what we call evidence-based medicine. And what that basically means is we only do things that we can prove work. So you'd think that there would be a lot of evidence about this device which has been implanted in many thousands of people around the world. But these are all the areas of literature where you will find evidence for the rod. Now, the ones in red are where a publication has been released in a scientific journal. The others are presentations at meetings. And uh, 
the uh, Sydney paper comes from David Little's group in, Sid in Sydney, which was the first one published in the literature. And at one year, about 13% of these rods needed to be changed because they weren't doing what they're doing. Sounds like a lot, but then if you look at more recent literature, even from Montreal where the rod is created, if you read a paper they've ri recently written on functional outcome and you dissect the detail, they're telling you that at an unknown length of time, about 35% of the rods have been changed because they're not doing what they're doing. And once again, let me stress that people do fracture even with rods in, so you're never going to get 100% success with any of these procedures. Um, but there are problems with the device, and it's to do with the fact, uh, the way that you put it in, it's the way that it can bend even when you're doing it during surgery, and the way that the rod is prepared when you put the male component over the, uh, the female component over the male component. Um, the other thing is the structure of the rod. It's got threads, and when you have a bone that's growing, right at the top and the bottom of the bone, there's a layer of cartilage which thickens and then gets converted into bone. And that's how long bones get longer. It's this cartilage thickening. So if you put threads across this area of bone, you can theoretically damage the growth and cause shortening or cause a deformity. And when these rods pull out, these threads can then cross over that area of the bone and is something that you need to be aware of. And the other key problem with the FD rods, if you imagine one cylinder over another that's, that's moving up and down and sliding, like an aerial, it's not stable with regards to rotation. So what that means is if you've got someone who's had a procedure and they've had one of these rods put in, you can't just let them get up and get about unless there's a real press fit with the, the rod and the outside of the bone. So that can mean you get twisting deformities of the leg if it doesn't heal right. So this rod, and at the stage, at present time, nearly all the rods we have aren't rotationally stable, which limits our ability to get our patients and get, get, get people up and about after surgery as soon as possible. The other rod that's um, popular, although has been superseded by the FD rod, is the Sheffield rod. Now, although it's called the Sheffield rod, it's a modification of a rod devised in the States called the Bailey Duval. It's a much simpler device, and it's got what we call the T-piece at the top and the bottom of the bone. So in order to put the Sheffield rod in, you have to approach the bone both from the top and the bottom. So an incision at the knee and the top of the uh, thigh for the femur, and at the ankle and at the knee if you want to put a rod into the tibia. Now the difficulty with that is a technically challenging procedure that involves quite a lot of dissection to make the space to put the rod in. And because of the difficulty, it was something that wasn't very popular around the world. But we know from the Sheffield rod that at 19 years follow-up, it works quite well. And at 19 years, if you look at patients who've had the surgery, and we're talking about back in the day before some of them were getting bisphosphonates, so before bisphosphonates were routine, when we were doing those old type of uh, osteotomies, the shish kebab osteotomies, what we know is that at that stage, about 35% of the rods needed revising because they didn't do what they were meant to do. Now another 15% were revised because the kids grew so much that the ends of the rod separated completely. So the actual reoperation rate is 50%, but when you exclude growth, it tells you that is this new rod that we're using quite commonly really as good? as what we've been doing in the past. And if I'm honest with you, the answer is still out there. It's not something that we're aware of because the right sorts of studies haven't been done. Those aren't the only two other rods. In South Korea, they use this rod, which is again a modification of the Sheffield rod, which is designed with a hole in one of the rods at the bottom where you can put a wire through to anchor it in the bottom. So this modifies that rod so that you only have to put it in at the top. It's not really used anywhere else in the world, but the results published by this group uh, are actually reasonable as well. But what is a bit more exciting is what the future holds for telescopic rods. And there are new rods now becoming available. There's one currently been de being designed in the US by a company um, with input from all around the world. And there is a chap in Ukraine who this year has published his new rod, which is a rotationally stable rod. He's used it in a few patients locally, but it's not yet available commercially. And there's another rod that is available commercially, just to the right, which has been developed in Turkey. Now, obviously, all these things you have to look at carefully, um, particularly when they're, when they're untried and untested. Um, but the key thing is, I think the rotationally stable rods are going to be much better for people. It's going to allow us to get them up and about and avoid complications early. Um, on with bone healing and further fractures. Now, 
locking nails. Locking nails are thicker nails that have holes in the top and the bottom through which you can, in the other plane, put, put a screw or, a, or, or any sort of device that stabilizes it. And this is the workhorse of orthopedics around the world. It's a technique that we use in adults for trauma, um, for all, sort, all manner of things. Um, the difficulty is that the technology has never been of the size that you can use it in patients with OI unless they have very mild and very similar mechanics and size of the femur or tibia that you would do in someone who was you would consider normal. Um, now the advantage of modern techniques is these rods have been redesigned in terms of how you put them in and also the size, so the size has got smaller. So what we can now do is use these devices in people who are nearly at the end of their growth because we don't need a rod to telescope anymore because the bone is not going to get much longer. And these are much stronger at resisting deformity and therefore reduce fracture, uh, reduce fracture risks in the future. The other advantage of these is because you can lock these nails by putting screws through them, you can protect other, area of the femur, other areas of the bones such as in the femur, the neck of the femur, um, where fractures can also occur. Um, another area that's really come on at speed is what we call lengthening nails. And what these are, are devices that have motors within the nails themselves that respond to magnets. And they actually elongate on their own. Now, it's not something that you can really use in growing bone at the moment, but it's used a lot in deformity correction and in people that have short, short bones because of various reasons. So to the far left, you can see someone who has a tilted pelvis because the femur to the right of the picture, which is the left femur, is shorter than the other side. Now, obviously, if you've got a limb length discrepancy and you're someone that walks around, that causes pain in your hip, pain in your knee, pain in your opposite knee, and sometimes pain in your back. So the middle picture shows you one of these nails. And if you look closely, you can see in the middle there's some slightly blacker areas where the motor is inside it. So you can, you can decide how much you want to lengthen a bone by. So you divide it, put the nail in, and then make it longer by one centimetre a day. And you don't get a black gap behind you. It gradually fills in with new bone, which then consolidates. And that's another technique that we can use that we're gradually transferring over to, to people who do have OI. But again, we're very limited due to the size of the bone and the size of the technology that dictates how big the device will be. Now, plates is something that if you look through all your orthopedic textbooks, it tells you you shouldn't really use in an isolated way in people with fractures or deformity in OI, simply because in the past the screws would pull out of the bone because of the mechanical properties of bone and it was likely to fail. But the technology here has changed as well, and it's produced something we call locking plates. So if you imagine a screw, it's made up of its threaded bit and it's got a screw head. Now, the screw heads in locking plates have thread in them, so what that means is when you put the screw into the plate, the screw is locked into the plate and can't come out of the plate. And that means mechanically it's a lot more stable at dealing with bone that's pathologically weak. And its principal indication and design for, was for use in fractures in the elderly who have osteoporosis and weak bone. There's now some evidence you can see below. This is a paper again that comes from South Korea where they've looked at using these in association with rods to try and get difficult cases to heal such as non-unions, or refractures, and the evidence is that this works pretty well, certainly in the case series that, that have been published. But we must also remember that it's not just the surgical management of OI treatment that moves forward. The medical management is the place where we've seen massive advances and also massive improvements in quality of life and functional outcomes for people with OI. But bisphosphonates do have problems, and one of the problems that we're, we're seeing um, we've identified initially in adults with osteoporosis who have been on long-term bisphosphonates. Because it affects the way burn, bone turns over, it, bone struggles to remodel defects, and so you get these little stress fractures that develop in areas where there's high, high levels of forces, which in, tend to be in the upper parts of the femur, which then, without history of trauma, go on and lead to a fracture. And the case that you can see here if you look closely towards the top of the bone, you can see one of these cracks developing in the outside of the bone. So this is something that was published um, from work done at Sheffield a few years ago, and there's an article actually this month that has confirmed the same thing that comes from Canada. So bisphosphonates are of such a massive advantage to patients, as well as um, the use of surgery, and this is exactly what they found in adults with osteoporosis, but we need to modify our surgical management.
management to help limit the changes that we're seeing because the, 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 the pathology is changing slightly as well. Um, the other condition we call, uh, that we need to talk about is what we call protrusio acetabuli, which is a real mouthful even for me, but basically what it means is that the sockets of the hip are too deep, and if you look at the picture in the middle, what you normally have with a hip is a socket that covers most of the ball, but because of the problems that you get with bone, it tends to be very deep inside the socket of the ball, uh, the, the head of the femur. And because of this, you tend to find that the hip movements are reduced. And it's a thing that you commonly see in people with type 3 OI, but you do get it in other groups. And what we think is that this predisposes, because of the way the forces go across the bone, to fractures around the femoral neck. And the picture to the far right shows a femoral neck fracture in someone who has a bone. So when we were talking about rods and trying to limit uh, the potential for problems, surgery again has to address these issues or be aware of them so that we know what we need to do to try and limit problems developing. Now, we've talked a bit about non-union, and this is a very difficult problem, not just in OI, but in all cases, um, where you have a bone where the two ends will not heal together. And there are lots of things that we can do and again, orthopaedics is, is, is something that we, we take experience from other areas and uh, most non-union knowledge comes from treating patients who've had infections after surgery for their bones. And we can use cages on people's legs to encourage bone healing. There's also the potential to use pulse ultrasound. So ultrasound, not like you'd have if you went for a scan, but at a high frequency. And that can stimulate bone to heal where it might not have healed before. Um, there is a, a, a type of medication which is called BMP, bone morphogen morphogenetic protein, which is actually a, a molecule of protein that's found in normal bone at very low levels. And what we can do is we can produce this, and it's a very potent stimulator of bone healing. And that's something we use quite a lot in older patients. There are concerns about its use in children, which limits it to some cases where we feel the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, the other thing that we can do is use more modern grafting techniques or look at what's been done in the past in adults and transfer that over to people who specifically have OI. And below we can see um, something that's been published this year from the state, which is where they use something called a sandwich graft with on you. So what you do is you take a piece of bone from someone who no longer needs it, you sterilise it, you prepare it, and you split it and you sandwich the non union with this other person's bone. And the group from the States have commented on very good results in dealing with quite difficult um, uh, uh, non-unions. But like I say, not everyone, it's not something that you can apply to everyone with all of these things. It depends on the indication and the, the actual person who has the particular problem. So to summarise, surgery still has a very large amount of questions in terms of what we do. But we are getting more answers now than we had before. We're also getting better at treating both fractures and deformities, but there's a lot more work that we still need to do. Thank you.